filling is another important uh, process to keep the water out of the base of your roads. Asphalt mastics are a relatively new product, or newer to this marketplace at least. So there it's a hot applied product, similar to hot pour crack filler, but it has uh, aggregate mineral fillers in there for specifically for filling larger gaps and potholes. Uh, common process in Saskatchewan, seal coating and chip seal is uh, very common in secondary roads, some city streets, major highways, basically everywhere you've driven in Saskatchewan there'll be some form of asphalt seal coat or chip seal. Microsurfacing is another process available to uh, the agencies. It's very good for filling wheel ruts and getting skid resistance back in the roads. Um, Lastly, uh, would be a fog seal or sand seal. It can be used to rejuvenate the surface of your aged and oxidized roads, as well as uh, maintaining the darkness of your roads and your visibility of your paint lines. So here we have basically a, a chart, a very common chart you'll see around where uh, you see as you pave your road, you get the best uh, pavement condition and after about eight to 10 years, it starts to decline. That's kind of the, the trigger for when you need to do some road preservation. So like any road preservation at that point tends to save you a lot of money in the long run, as you can see. So typically the first process might be crack filling, maybe a fog seal, sand seal, that kind of thing. And then a few years later, maybe you'll move up to like a chip seal or microsurfacing process. Here's another chart very similar. This is from the Federal Transportation and Highways Committee. So this again shows that uh, after you have about a 40% drop in quality, like any amount of money, like spending $1 in preservation, then will save you uh, 6 to $10 in rehabilitation later on in the life of the road. So again, some of the products uh, that are available uh, primarily everybody's fairly uh, familiar with pothole filling so the options available are really bulk winter cold mix and uh, big winter cold mix. Big mix is generally used in uh, the winter time or if there's a, a small quantity needed. Uh, we also manufacture a, a dense graded bulk cold mix which can be used for larger patches, utility cuts, culverts, uh, things like that. It's uh, not very workable in the winter time, but during the, the spring and fall and summer, that's uh, one of the options that Sask Highways, for example, uses a lot of. Uh, different types of crack sealants. If you got a crack that's uh, basically lar smaller than five millimeters, you're going to want to use a hot or cold pour crack sealant, or route and seal, a variety of different uh, methods. Anything larger, like five to 25 millimeters spray patch is typically the process that's uh, applied to the roadways. That's basically uh, a machine that will spray out the uh, crack with compressed air, spray oil on the ground, and then uh, an oil and rock mixture. Uh, it's fairly common as well on like transverse cracks, longitudinal cracks, things like that. Uh, as well for your tracks, uh, if you have a lot of longitudinal tracks, microsurfacing with uh, microfill is a very common process. It's very quick. It can be used to fill in kind of that uh, little gutter in the middle of the road where the pavement joint has started to uh, deteriorate. One of the newer products, the asphalt mastics, uh, it's very common in cities uh, to improve drainage and things like that. In the before picture, you can see where the water has been running, the asphalt has been getting uh, deteriorated, the water has been getting into the base. Uh, there's been some effort of hot pour crack filling, but obviously there's just uh, too many cracks there for that to be effective. In the after picture you can see it's basically, it's now got a waterproofed uh, hot applied layer that will improve the drainage and uh, fight the water. The asphalt mastics is another common uh, use for them nowadays is around manholes and storm drains where you have maybe have a raised storm drain or the the water has uh, worn away some of the asphalt around 
the manhole and storm drain. This will get your uh, level surface and drainage back as well as protect the, uh, the base around the manhole. So there's just another slide of like a finished manhole where it was, uh, it, this one was raised up about an inch prior. So rather than have the water sit in that gap between the manhole and the pavement, now it's uh, able to get into the manhole. So I have a, a video here, it's a narrated video on chip seal. I'm not sure how many people are familiar with chip seal, but it's very uh, informative. Uh, the actual video itself was taken on Highway 1 while we were working for Saskatchewan Highways a few years ago. Doesn't look like it's going to work for me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It might not have uh, transferred properly when we moved over to the computer. That's right. It doesn't look like the video is going to work, but if you, anybody would like, we'll have it at our. Uh, trade show booth all day today. So sand sealing, it's uh, another common form. It's smaller aggregate with basically sand and a rejuvenator emulsion. Compared to chip seal, it's kind of a lesser product. It's commonly used on uh, paved shoulders and things like that where you don't see a lot of traffic or uh, oxidized surfaces on uh, newer pavements. Here we have a comparison of microsurfacing and before and after. You can see on the uh, left we have a older asphalt surface, some crack filling on it, some raveling in the, the surface of the road. And then uh, we have the finished road on the, the right hand side where we would have uh, filled in the wheel ruts, given it uh, drainage again and did all the line painting. I had a video here of the microsurfacing, but looks like this one's going to work. So this video is in the, the city of Calgary, actually, which has a uh, an annual program. So many people think that it's just a process for highways. However, this is commonly used in uh, the city of Saskatoon as well, between curb and gutters. It's a very fast and efficient process. We can uh, be in and out of a neighborhood within a day or two rather than a, a paving project that might take a few weeks and disturb the, uh, the traffic and the, the parking on the streets, things like that. So basically the material comes out of the microsurfacing machine like a, almost like an oatmeal, gets spread on the road. It's brown initially before the emulsion breaks and then it will turn black as it starts to set up. You, can, you see the lane on the right hand side would have been completed just before the the pass that they were doing in the video. It's basically a polymer modified asphalt emulsion, uh, Portland cement and water that gets mixed together. And in this case, there's also uh, fiberglass fibers for this particular job. That's a manhole that's been covered up. We tar, tar paper them and duct tape uh, a cover over the manholes initially. And later on in the video here, you'll see them uh, peel that back up. Typical hot mix paving, you would uh, have to go around ahead of time and lower all the manholes out of the way and then you'd have to go back after and raise them back up. It's not, uh, no utility adjustments are required for the microsurfacing. You can see here that uh, basically there's one surface right next to uh, what we did in 2015 that had been down for eight years. Here's just a few uh, notes on kind of the, the benefits of microsurfacing, the, how cost effective it is, the greenhouse gases that are reduced, things of that nature. You can see here, there's many cities now that have gone to an annual project 
Uh, and there are cities like Saskatoon, for example, will release two tenders every year and uh, do several hundred lane kilometers of city streets with microsurfacing. Just gonna go back here a couple of slides and see if that other one will uh, work here for us now. No luck. So in closing, So in closing, I thought I'd just bring up this slide. This is uh, basically two cities in Manitoba. Each own half the road. The city on the right performed preventative road maintenance, and the city on the left did not. And you see basically that the same age of original hot mix pavement, that the different road conditions that they're, uh, they're dealing with. Obviously, I think I speak for everybody. I would like the, the road on the right a lot more than the road on the left. So in conclusion, there's uh, lots of economical tools available to preserve roads and upgrade from loose surface to hard surface roads like chip seal. Uh, better service can be provided to ratepayers at a lower cost than rehabilitation. Once you uh, let the road go too far and you got to rip it all up and re redo your base and your pavement, like the cost is astronomical compared to preserving what you have, similar to maybe shingling your roof rather than waiting till it leaks. Uh, preservation has been proven to be environmentally friendly and economical over the long term by almost every agency around. I guess I'll uh, open it up to any questions. Some of the new materials that might be added to asphalt now, I've heard things as far as like plastics and things like that. Can you speak to any of that and the, the durability or what you guys are doing, if any of those? Yep. Yeah, so some of the newer uh, pavement products that are being used kind of in Western Canada here, a lot of them are polymer modified. So some of that will be natural rubber, some of it that will be synthetic kind of rubber. Uh, it's very common in microsurfacing. It's even found in your uh, chip seals now where... Uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that was not really the case. Even in your hot mix paving, pavements now, you're seeing a lot of uh, polymer modifieds. Saskatchewan Highways this year is basically going to use it on Highway 1 and 16. About 10% of their network, I believe, is going to see it. But that 10% of their, their network sees probably 15% of their traffic as well, right? Uh, some of the other items that are newer would be uh, fibers. There's a variety of different kind of fibers available. There's fibers for chip seal, fibers for microsurfacing, fibers in asphalt pavement, anywhere from airbed fibers to fiberglass to uh, recycled glass, things like that. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, we appreciate you attending our trade show. And uh, we'll start the next session at 11 o'clock. Thank you.
for the first one. Uh, it's great to see you again, and if not, please uh, hustle on over to the southeast side. Uh, my name is Lee Finish, and I'm the Central Region Director for SUMA and a counselor for the Town of Fort Capel. It's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, uh, Jay Brian Blay, uh, who's representing JBB Consultants and Engineers and RC's Refrigeration Compliance Solutions. Today he'll be speaking about CO2 refrigerant and low GWP refrigerants for the energy efficient ice rinks and uh, curling clubs. Designates, please give our presenter a warm welcome. Brian? Thank you. How's my volume there? Is everybody okay? Great. I want to thank everybody for the outstanding attendance. Well, thank you very much for taking a few minutes. Uh, this is a bit of a truncated uh, um, edition of a presentation I did back in Chicago at the ASHRAE seminar. Um, and it's uh, still very, very important to uh, rinks uh, in our area and in our region of Western Canada in regards to refrigerants and energy efficiency. So our outline is the refrigerant phase-down availability of, of, of refrigerants that rinks are facing today, performance and environmental criteria of the gases that are available. Uh, we're going to review some tools and methods to decide what refrigerant gas is best. A little bit of history on CO2 as a refrigerant. Is anybody aware that CO2 is now being used as a refrigerant for rinks? Very popular. Very environmentally friendly as well. We'll review a couple of projects that we were involved in recently and over the last couple of years and a few steps forward of where CO2 is going in the rink industry. So I'm sure as everybody has probably heard at some point in time, if you've had anything to do with rinks, uh, the refrigerant issue is a, a big issue. CFCs have been phased out, no longer available since 1986-87 Montreal Protocol. Uh, HFCs are being phased out. January 1st was a big day for HFCs. Uh, R22 is no longer available and there are going to be more that are going to follow. HFC 134A is still in production but is being reduced and those phase downs are being sped up. And HFOs are the new blends or more drop-ins, 448, 449. So in the United States, uh, they've been adopting minimum GWP values that start at about 3,000, drop to 1,500, 1,500 to 750, 750 down to as low as 150. There are now 26 states that don't allow refrigerants of anything greater than a GWP of 150. That makes it very difficult for new and retrofit rinks. So what's left? Natural gases, natural refrigerants, ammonia and CO2 with a GWP of zero and a GWP of one. Uh, something uh, I, I spun up here just doing a little bit of research. October 1930, the American Society of Refrigeration Engineers, ammonia and carbon dioxide. It's been used for years and it's coming back. I call this a bit of a back to the future. And you can notice there, there was some, some um, hydrocarbons, propane and butane, excellent refrigerants, but they have this flammability problem that we would have to overcome. So this is even before the R11, CFC, 12, 502 were even started. Just to give you a little bit of a, of a comparison, that's the reason R22 has been phased out as of January. R134A is about 1300. 507, 404 were very popular, but they're also very, very high. Uh, R513 is a new uh, blend. You can see it's a mixture soup of a bunch of refrigerants, fairly low. So it's got a few more years left, and those drop-ins are very high. 407C was popular for a while. Again, 1774. These are very, very high numbers environmentally. And again, the natural zero and one. And those numbers mean that one pound of R22 is equivalent to 1,800 pounds of CO2. So what are the factors when you're trying to choose what the best gas is for your system? Well, it goes beyond just the GWP. You've got to look at energy efficiency ratio, coefficient of performance, the total equivalent warming impact, which is the input of the GHGs that are given off by the energy source you're burning and how efficient you're burning that energy source, uh, cost, of course, and lifespan and phase-down schedules. So what do you use? Well, there's an energy modeling software that's now available that'll take into the environmental impacts, the energy costs, the GHG, greenhouse gas emissions, and the life cycle costing for the full life cycle of the plant with a variety of refrigerant options. So this is a short list of, of this type of modeling that we've done for some clients. Uh, most of these are in the United States. I spent about four years, last four, four and a half years doing work in the US. Uh, and a couple of key projects here. We did a job in uh, North Dakota, which was the first direct CO2 um, rink in uh, the lower 48. 
and just recently finished a, a review of uh, an NBA facility uh, to convert an R22 plant. And all of these were existing facilities that had R22 or some other drop-in gas and they needed an option for change. A little bit of history of CO2. As we say, it was used way back in the day. It grew and then right around the time that CFC started, it dropped off and now it's starting to come back. Some pros of the, uh, of the gas. It's green, it's natural, the low GWP of course. It's inert, non-flammable, non-toxic. Very, very efficient volumetrically. Uh, you need less fu fluid flow to get the same amount of energy uh, or, or refrigeration and you require smaller pipes. Some of the cons, it runs at very high pressures. This scares a few people, but then I remind them if they have a power washer at home when they're washing their car, that's at 3,500 PSI. This is at 2,100 PSI. So it's not unusual for an industrial plant. A little bit of a comparison, uh, pressure to temperature of CO2 to traditional gases. You see right at about where you're running in summer operation, the pressure gets quite high. But we have technology to, to combat that. There's also a little bit of a penalty in the warmer climates, but where we're situated in Western Canada, there's still absolutely no problem for using, especially in seasonal plants, using CO2 as a refrigerant in direct and indirect orientation. A little bit of an update of world use for CO2 systems. This was hot off the press here in, uh, in November. As you can see, we are, uh, this is supermarkets. We are definitely trailing the European Union. We're about 20 to 30 years behind them. They adopted this a long time ago. You hadn't been able to get a hold of uh, R22 in the European Union since 1993, 94. So we got a long way to go. These have now changed actually since uh, this was uh, updated in November. So I'll review a couple of uh, deeper dives into a couple of examples of some projects we've done. One was that NBA facility where they had an R22 skid with a glycol steel floor, essentially an NHL ready facility, and also the new build in North Dakota which was uh, uh, an engineer looking to be green and efficient. So what we did with our modeling software is we took the existing R22 and we compared it to the, the chosen gases that the customer wanted to consider. Now, unfortunately, they weren't able to use ammonia just because of the uh, location of the facility within the downtown area and they just didn't have the space. But they wanted to know just for interest how it compared. So we compared the existing R22 to a whole gaggle of gases. And they were running for about eight to nine months out of the year. The results were quite stunning and quite, uh, uh, quite direct. There was the reference R22. We were able to make an estimate based on 8,760 hour runtime for the eight months. And you could see that CO2 was significantly better than the existing plant. Uh, R134A actually used more energy. Ammonia was shown just for reference. And the, the key point here is to look at the energy efficiency of those gases. All of these are very, very similar until you get to here. The energy software also calculates all of the CO2 emissions with the refrigerant charge, a recycle rate, and a leakage rate estimated for all the gases. It then compares all of those through the lifespan and then gives you a CO2 emission lifetime from installation, recycle, and indirect costs of, of CO2 footprint. Life cycle cost analysis from a financial standpoint, and again, the CO2 was clearly the winner. So their decision was to reuse the existing steel ethylene floor, change out the refrigerant to a CO2 skid, replace the fluid cooler and a new control system. Uh, that went to bid in, uh, in uh, February of last year, or pardon me, March of last year. So another uh, project we were involved in, a gentleman phoned us up from Bismarck and he says, I want to do a CO2 rink. At that point, we hadn't done a whole lot of them. He'd never done a rink himself, but he wanted energy efficiency, a long-term low GWP gas, and he wanted to make sure that installation of ongoing maintenance was a, was a key consideration for the design. At that point, there was only a couple that were in Alaska with a direct floor with CO2. There was another one that was finished in 18. There was a retrofit in Montreal of the University of Concordia. And there were a bunch in Quebec. None, one or two in Western Canada, but no direct floors in the U.S. at that point. 
We ran the numbers. He was happy with that. That was the reason he went to the CO2 instead of ammonia. Didn't even consider the F gases. Again, a seasonal plant, not running between May and September. Whoop. So just to, to clarify, a direct system has the refrigerant in the pipes right in the concrete. There is no secondary fluid, calcium or glycol being pumped. This is very typical of 99%, 100% of the rinks we see in Western Canada. And this is now the new use of direct CO2 in the concrete floor. So the design in Bismarck was a nine month max, 90 tons. It was an overfed floor. There were no welds in the floor, continuous loop piping to and from the header trench. Uh, had a few spectators, uh, heat reclaim, and a very small engine space. With an open header trench, that was a, that was a decision by the owner. Very, very small supply and return lines as compared to six or eight inch. Glycol, you now have a two to three inch uh, supply and suction. Stainless steel tubing in the floor and four inch centers. And brace plate heat exchangers. All on a factory skid. The floor was designed for about 1200 PSI, standing pressure. And there was a total charge of about 2800 pounds of CO2 in the system. There's just a cutaway of the, the floor with the half inch stainless tubes. I do have some samples of that right here. If you'd like to take a peek at that afterwards, that's what was buried in the concrete versus one inch plastic pipe. There's a view of the pipes as they were shipped to site. Those were in six or 700 foot runs. We did some practice at the factory. We weren't very good at bending it out that first time. Back in 05 or 15, we got a lot better when we got to site. There's a cutaway of the existing plastic headers that would be buried at center ice. And this is very typical of a very, very typical US operation. It's becoming more typical here in Canada. By eliminating the header trench, you save a bunch of space in the building and re reduce your concrete um, installation costs. Sorry? This is filled with concrete. This is filled with concrete entirely. Yeah, we can talk after. Yep. And this is what we did here in Bismarck with the traditional header trench. This is not standard. Again, he wanted this. The engineer and the owner wanted this because they want to have access to those uh, welds. Those were the only welds in the floor. So he went out 200 feet, 200 feet back and back. Traditional now, they would bury the two and three inch headers just like this at Center Ice. This header trench, as they say, is about 23 to 28 yards of concrete and takes up an extra 10 feet or eight feet of your building, which is very expensive when you're building a larger new structure. There's the header trench insulated, the cover. So you can see the space that it takes up. We went with winged headers here, save refrigerant charge. The headers were all done on site, welded on site. There's the curvature standard 28 radius 28 foot radius of the rink. And then from the header supply and return out and back. So those are the only two welds in the, in the floor. There's the return bend trench on the other side. We just peeled back the uh, plastic and came back. And we made a few mistakes. Having to turn that at 200 feet, it was quite difficult. We've got a couple of them shown here, they kinked. So we had to come up with a better way of turning that back. We did that 35 times. We, how do you say, make a mistake 34 times, you'll learn the next time. Well, that's pretty much what happened. There's a little schematic of the, of the refrigerant skid that was there, very, very small and compact. There's the actual picture of it, Canadian made out of Quebec. A view, there's the floor in the background and the skid. Compressors readily available and easily retrofitable. We actually sent an extra skid in a box as a replacement. Sits on the floor. And that's the extent of the condenser, very much smaller than a standard uh, fluid cooler or an evap condenser. So financially, it, it required no fire rated room, no diffusion tank, less piping, pumping, 
smaller footprint and very much smaller roof mounted equipment. Um, there was infrastructure by the saving of the structural, smaller footprint and no room for off skid pumps and sump. Next steps, ejectors are used to handle in the, heat, in, the, in the warmer climate. As we said earlier, CO2 doesn't do all that well above 90 degrees because of the critical temperature, but there are now technologies that are helping us improve that. Prefabricated headers, next step. These are the socklets, I got samples of those as well, those little socklets. This was all done on the field. Next would be, that would be done in the factory. So some future work, we're actually working with Red River Community College, we're going to get some research dollars and get some actual runtime consumption. So we're now able to model it of, of your exact rink. If your compressors run a certain period of time, we will model with the exact rink runtime of your plant to give you an actual uh, enhanced version of that energy model. And hopefully we'll have some, uh, some uh, white papers issued with, uh, with the results of the research. So CO2 floors provide an extremely high quality playing surface, much, much better than the indirect glycol or calcium chloride. The design difference are, are minimal with the stainless steel tubing, just a different height for your chairs. And as more come online, uh, the uptake's uh, increasing dramatically. Any questions? So I guess for communities that have existing rinks, smaller communities, 2,000, 3,000 people, something like that, what are the first steps? And then just some, some rough ideas on costs for the retrofit. First steps are to review what your viable options are for refrigerants. Decide whether you want to replace the floor or reuse the floor. We talked a lot about here being new floor with direct. You can use CO2 with the indirect floor, but it's not as efficient. So then you have to sit there and say, okay, is my floor cracking? Is it 30, 35 years old? Is it time for a replacement? If you're at that stage, the direct is the way to go. But we would still go through that analysis to do that comparison. That study is key. Because then you take in the full life cycle cost, the full GHGs, the full energy. It's a financial, it's an environmental and sustainable response. But it is, it is viable for any rink, new, retrofit, reuse, or new floor. Thank you. He charges $40 to attend. Yeah. <laughs> Just with the pumps, uh, you can use your, uh, your old system over again? Like You can. And like... I know the floor, he was asking about the floor, but with, uh, with all your brine pumps and all that, they're reusable, like, or is it a different system? Like a you, can, you can replace just the skid, but again, that's a decision you have to, am I able to get this back up on the screen here? Uh, duplicate. Yeah, just hit duplicate right there. Yep. Oh. There. Yeah, yeah. So this would be a new installation where you replace the floor and put that in the floor. You can also use a CO2 skid and reuse it to your existing glycol or calcium system. Just not going to be as efficient. Okay. 15%? Yes, because you're adding a pump, that pump is adding heat, and now you're going from a CO2 primary to some secondary refrigerant. A calcium chloride probably, where, where are you located? Okay, so it's probably calcium chloride. That's better than the glycol. Yeah, brine, salt solution, 121, yeah. So it's better than the glycol, but the, the big key there is to, to say, okay, how old is my floor? Is that floor ready for a replacement in the next five to seven? You can, still, you can still add that to your existing floor. It just, you wouldn't be reaping the 30, 35, 40% efficiencies of a direct floor. And the quality of the ice of the direct, because you have the refrigerant right in the floor, is far superior. It reacts quicker, it's harder, it's, it's stronger, it doesn't snow up as much. But yes, absolutely, you can, you can reuse your floor. You 
wouldn't want to use your existing skid, though. You can't. Can't. That's your, what I was getting at. Your existing yeah. skid cannot be retrofitted to the pressures. Right. You're talking, well, you got ammonia or, or Freon? Uh, be uh, Freon. Okay. So you're going to be looking at 40 pounds and, and 250 pounds, mm -hmm. right? The floor here is at 500 pounds. Yeah. And the high side's at 2,100 pounds. So you're looking at much different pipe, much thicker pipe. So you cannot put CO2 into an existing skid. It's a complete new skid. And like you said with the pressures, the, that's hard to compare a uh, pressure washer to volumes, right? It's volume and pressure makes a big difference too, right? So of, of course, but, you know. but one, of the, one of the knocks of a lot of the Freon people or the Freon manufacturers is saying, oh, you better be afraid of CO2 because it's got high pressure. You see the thickness of some of these pipes. There are codes in place. Engineers are sizing it. Certified installers are, are meeting quality control manuals to put it in. Thank you. Thank you. Let us know if we can help you with a review or an audit. No Winnipeggers. I just want to clarify, actually, you probably could use your existing package to a point. When you said, because you said your brine pumps, you can still use that side of your package, that secondary side, off a heat exchanger. And most municipalities and towns don't have the, uh, the, the funds to just change everything to CO2. You could buy the package, convert over with a heat exchanger, keep circulating your brine solution, and then years down the line, redo the floor. Yeah, but, but he asked whether the skid could be reused well, but on the refrigeration. Pumps. That's right, John, pick up the brine pump. So part of that skid, I don't know how that skid's made. Who made the skid, you know? Yeah, if, okay. you no if you notice what I've shown here is the floor and the pumps can be reused and tied to a new skid. Wow. <laughs> how many tons? Is it seasonal? Is it year round? Uh, how often? How often do you run? From September to March. And how many seats? How many view viewers? And so we'll assume it's eighty-five by two hundred rink. Yeah. So you have so you have maybe fifty, sixty tons of capacity. You might be looking It'd at half a million, about, about half a million dollars. Yeah, but it, but that's a that's a you can, that's a piece of equipment that's going to last for forty years, right? And 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 if you if you notice by the discussions we had here, the audit and the energy study we do looks at it over a life cycle. We're not just looking at a first cost. It's got to take into maintenance. It's got to take in the ongoing costs, your input costs, and you're looking at a thirty-five to forty-year investment. Thank you for the question. Well, also, Brian, maybe you want to clarify a little bit about the compression and how the, as the ambient temperature drops, a seasonal rink, that your compression actually doesn't, doesn't run. Your compressors actually don't run. I was affiliated with Brian uh, in the United States installing that job in Bismarck. So as the ambient, that, that's why in Canada it works so good, because as the ambient temperature drops, you actually can cycle off your compressors and they don't run. So now that package runs a hell of a lot longer before you have to overhaul your machines or replace your compressors, because they're not running. You know, on a day like yesterday, okay, they're probably all gonna run, because it got warm, right? But at 30 below, you're gonna run your ice plant with no compression, or very little. So that's what the savings is. And also, what doesn't factor into here is the wear and tear on your equipment. They can show you the energy, but when you're not running a, a pump or a compressor, well, what's that saving you? That's saving you lots down the line. Well, so. one of the advantages of CO2 is that it gets very, CO2 gets very, very efficient in cold weather. So it's very well matched to our climate. And that's why it's being praised so highly as an alternative to the existing system. Your existing system has to run at a certain pressure to make sure it stay, stays running. It's not able to float your head pressure. With CO2, you're able to float it. As the temperature drops outside, the efficiency gets even better. You run even fewer compressors, which is where a lot of the savings come from. This is very interesting because you see in red the R22, the global warming, it's 1810. 
Today, the, refer, the preferred refrigerant that's going in in a lot of hockey rinks for R22 is R408 slash 409. And is it much difference than the 1800? They're taking the R22 off the, basically off the market to gain what? So you can change again your refrigerant in the next 10, 15 years, maybe less. I don't know. Like Brian said, in the state of California, basically 513 is going in now because of the 631. So what's it tomorrow? Yep. If you go CO2 or ammonia, it's not coming off the market. This is a Band-Aid solution. That's, those are going to be phased out in the next five to seven years. And again, I mentioned earlier, you get somebody with some cojones in the White House and he actually cares about the environment, these things are going to be sped up even faster. He just doesn't care enough to push it hard enough. Individual states are doing it on their own, not federally. Thank, Thank you. you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for the presentation. And obviously the, uh, the information will be on the YouTube channel and uh, probably the presentation on our websites later on. Our next presenter, our next presenter is Scott Golding of Gold Standard Engineering. Uh, he's going to be focusing on asset management and sharing a practical field-based approach to asset management. Uh, let's all welcome Scott to the stage. Start going, or do you want me to wait for people? <clears throat> so this works how? Okay, welcome everyone to the 2020 SUMA convention. My name is Scott Golding and I'm the proprietor for Gold Standard Engineering. I will be speaking to you today about field-based asset management. So we've all heard the famous corporate cliche about, su about success being a journey and not a destination. Aside from glitzy car commercials or Caribbean cruise advertisements, asset management is really one of those things where this is true. As we will talk about today, your community's direct involvement in asset management will bring better results and a more valuable product to your organization. With that in mind, within this presentation, we will cover what field-based asset management is, why it's helpful, and how communities can use it to improve their operations. So first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. My discipline is municipal engineering. I've been doing that for close to 20 years, roughly 25 counting my schooling. I've got a predominantly public sector background, and I've been involved in roles in planning, policy, strategy, and construction. I'm unusual within my field in that I'm a practicing generalist. I work on a wide variety of project types and scales where most engineers are specialists. I've got a strong professional interest in planning and strategy and it's an area like to raise awareness about. I've been practicing as a consultant for about five years and I formed my own company and I've been in business for more than a year doing primarily asset management. So we all know that we need to do asset management now or we're going to lose the gas tax funding. Most of us have already heard about PSAB and tangible capital asset registries. We've seen websites that make graphs and we've heard from savvy Australian experts that it will save us from ourselves. So why are we doing all of this? At its core, asset management plans should really identify three key ideas. What are your organization's goals? When are the big costs coming? And what are the risks that you face during your operations?
So what is field-based asset management? It's a contrarian approach. Most asset management programs are register or top-down based management styles created from existing office knowledge. It has a huge problem. The person making or overseeing the tangible capital asset registry is office-based and rarely goes outside. That list is highly theoretical and it relies heavily on old maps and other existing records. Like any builder or foreman knows, anyone that uses drawings regularly can attest to, something in a drawing may have changed or it may not be shown the way that it was built, which has spawned a whole new generation of documents called as-built drawings. Field-based asset management is a bottom-up style. We don't completely ignore the TCAR, but it is set aside first and we focus primarily on using it for comparison purposes. The methods are not mutually exclusive. Field-based asset management can either be used to improve or support a register-based system, or it can provide a standalone system from scratch. While most urban municipalities already have some kind of asset management system in place already, some agencies consider field-based asset management as a means to improve their practices. Field-based asset management is an exploratory process involving boots on the ground. Significant efforts are expended in locating and observing what is actually in a community with a fresh pair of eyes and with supplemented by tips and comments from field staff. Good documentation of these findings is essential so that decision makers that have a clear understanding of what they're actually responsible for, what the items do, and what conditions they are in. Registry-based systems can present some challenges. Most infrastructure supporting a given community has been built by previous generations. Years ago, documentation was not seen as important, and so the records are unreliable. The current focus of administrations and councils is usually towards infrastructure elements that have a relevant political issue associated with them, have attracted public attention for some reason, or are conspicuous. They are therefore contemporary issues. Most of the infrastructure just remains in the ground, doing its, back, its job in the background. So while it works, it's out of sight and out of mind. Through retirements, attritions, downsizing, and outsourcing, many municipal governments have lost a significant percentage of their corporate memory. This trend is accelerating as the baby boomer generation transitions into retirement. Old, unused, unusual, or issue-specific infrastructure is fading into obscurity. In many cases, records are poor or non-existent, and the corporate knowledge isn't being captured. Field-based asset management therefore helps to reduce records reliance, it eliminates corporate memory gaps, and rediscovers what has been lost to history. It's important to note that the underlying purpose of asset management is intended to account for future infrastructure-related liabilities so that you can make wise financial decisions today. Many communities have sites or items that have been abandoned but are still physically present there. These places have become dangerous to the public over time, and they are eventually going to need to be dealt with. Condition-based asset management accounts for such liabilities at disposals. Field-based ma asset management is more than an inventory. While compiling what is there is important, an equally important consideration is, is what condition these items are in. Field-based asset management thus assigns a numeric condition rating to all items that have been examined using standard scales. A distinct rating system is derived for each asset class based on engineering principles. The scales can range in sophistication to match the maturity of your asset management program. I recommend starting relatively simple early in the program and increasing complexity as your community's capabilities expand. Having a complete list of everything that your municipality actually owns is beneficial for a lot of purposes. It can help to illustrate the diversity and extent of the services being provided. It can justify requests for personnel and other resources. It can be used to evaluate the availability of storage space, plan for the purchase of parts and supplies. It's also useful for filtering out what isn't belonging to the municipality in cases where other items end up in municipal spaces. Likewise, from that list, it's very useful to helpful to know what is the worst of the bunch for anything that might be relevant from operating consequences, risk management, aesthetics. It's usually easier to get support for repairing the worst out of everything. 
Detecting condition patterns is also an important common one that I see frequently in epidemics of culvert damage in cases where pipes are being attacked and hit by mowers. The organization needs to adjust its strategy and operating practices to locate and account for these features to prevent damage to both the installation and the equipment. Asset management from a technical basis is tried and true, but it's not known and is notoriously nerdy. There is a sense out there that, in particular, that asset management is a new thing that's been important, uh, is important, as a, in kind of a new way of thinking. In reality, engineers have been doing asset management for over 50 years, and I've been involved with it through my entire career. As an industry, we've had some shortcomings, which has allowed the accountants to get involved with it very heavily. We're often focused too much on minor details, and in many cases, the client doesn't care if the structural distress index is 56 or 57. We'll spend a week to figure that out, though. In other cases, we fail to provide achievable mi milestones and achievable objectives for decision makers, telling a community that they have to repair 485 miles of roadway in a single year isn't going to happen, and it's not realistic. And more importantly, we've been preaching Tickle Little a lot. The public is getting wary of that approach. Alarmism doesn't work, and it isn't in sync with our normal experiences. For most of us, you get up, you drive to work, and your car isn't swallowed by a giant chasm on Main Street. Such things do happen, but it's in isolation in specific places, and it's not relatable to the daily routine. As mentioned earlier, field-based asset management can work well with an existing TCR drive system in ways listed here. It's a good way to fill gaps within your TCAR and to gauge how accurate the estimated useful life of the asset classes are as defined within your policies. The most important question, do the items at the end of their designated policy lives really need to be replaced, should be addressed very carefully. In some cases, there's condition maintenance treatments that can be applied to extend the life. In other cases, assets are being replaced before their stated policy life has expired. For instance, a common example, example is patrol graders that are situated within the policy to last 20 years, but then are replaced on five-year cycles to counter national wear and tear from heavy use. Therefore, there is a lot of items lasting longer or less than their stated length, but are already being depreciated. The findings of an asset management program must make sense intuitively to decision makers or there is no buy-in. This is likely one of the biggest failings of many asset management plans is predicting a doomsday scenario that's not supported by field conditions. This is usually due to poor registry data, poor correlating policy assumptions, or the adaptation of a template style product that doesn't put the legwork in to determine what's really going on in the community. The recommendations from an asset management program must be realistic and achievable or there is no hope and there's no value. The findings of an asset management program must also make sense intuitively to decision makers or there's no buy-in. Many people have spent appreciable time with the tangible capital asset registry and derived asset management practices and are aware of some of the shortcomings that can come from register-based models. Above all, asset management should make sense. Some situations that don't make sense include cases where 80% of your network value is assigned to 10% of the listing items, cases where linear assets have high annual depreciation expenses when adjacent neighboring sections have no expenses and they're both very similar in age and condition and appearance, in cases where 80% of the network has no defined value because age information is misleading. Registers are not set up with placeholders, so they're either set up as all or nothing occasions. So if there is no data, they get put with nominal or zero sum amounts. So that is not good for planning and operational purposes. The key to implementing the right solution for your community is to not use a CAN template. In many cases, CAN templates are highly generic and aren't specific enough to provide good value to the community. These risks can be mitigated with a local focus. Make the most of your employees' experience, having an assessment process that is well suited for your field staff, and focus on your own community's specific conditions. So how can it be determined objectively if your municipality is well managed? 
That's a subjective question that's inviting a lot of opinions and perhaps a fist fight or two in the audience. But there's obviously many good responses and there's no right or wrong answer. But I would argue that a well-run municipality meets all of its stated policy objectives and does so in a way that efficiently utilizes available resources. In other words, a working community is one that is true to its mandate and its mission. It does exactly what it says it will do using what it already has in the best way possible. So that's a great theory, but to determine efficiency, it is essential to have a strong understanding of all re required inputs and outputs. An accurate list of all asset items that supports the delivery of the service, detailed operating and maintenance and renewal costs, and an understanding of all these conditions that are vital. Field-based asset management is often better at doing this than unsupplemented registry breach approaches. So how does your community actually make decisions and set priorities? Most communities address issues sequentially and chronologically as specific problems are received. I call this approach a bottom-up, problem-down approach. The trouble that this causes is in most cases a community is usually dealing with a specific system in isolation. When a concern is raised to reduce its negative effects, it's deemed a success if the symptom goes away. The focus is on curing the symptom rather than diagnosing things. So the difficulty and little effort is spent on trying to figure out what is actually causing the issue or the underlying problem. So this is a quote from my own community that's in the news uh, relatively recently, and a quote from one of the city councillors was, it amazes me that we've got this piece of work here and went and decided to build a reservoir. I think we should have built a pump house. I think many of the elected officials can relate to this situation. A decision is made based on a certain set of facts that's been provided only to discover after the ball is in motion that there was other information that they weren't aware of at the time. Field-based asset management can facilitate parallel thinking. Concurrent renewal requirements compares options better, merit-based project selections, and to better understand opportunity costs. Age-triggered tr renewals found in a registry approach are only flagged when the estimated useful life threshold is eclipsed. Age is also separate from condition, and in many cases, age itself isn't a great invocation for when a renewal is actually needed. There are plenty of cases where something is old and well-built and is lasting very well, and something that is almost new is a lemon. Field-based asset management can help your community ensure that the time, effort, and money that is legally required to spend on this activity is providing real benefits to your operation. So as a quick summary to my presentation, I'd like to mention briefly the SUMA Advantage program. SUMA program is for co coordinated purchasing, which really benefits small municipalities that don't have a lot of administrative resources. Vendors are pre-qualified through that program. There is a convenient interface through the vendor panel software, and it provides assurances for many communities. Asset management is a defined service category under SUMA Advantage program. There are many uncertified practitioners out there, so SUMA Advantage streamlines what is a crowded field, and only reputable companies are listed. So I wanted to thank you all for your time and attention. Uh, my coordinates are on the slide behind me. Please feel free to call or email if you have any comments or questions. For any further discussion on asset management, municipal engineering, or any other subject of interest to communities, please drop by the Gold Standard booth, uh, booth 142, and I will be here for the rest of the trade show. Have a great afternoon, and enjoy the remainder of the SUMA convention. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much, Scott, and the next session will begin in about uh, 10.
First HR Services. All right, hello everybody and uh, welcome to everybody on the YouTube channel as well. Um, we're here to talk about performance reviews, not only if, you're, if you are counsel for your CAO, but also if you are a CAO for your staff. You will have some reviews that eventually you need to do. So when you think of performance reviews or evaluations, um, same kind of idea. Think about how does it make you feel? Or if you're having to do a review for your staff, does it make you feel awkward, uncomfortable? That's often the words that come up. But really what we want our CAOs or our staff to feel is encouraged, motivated. And so how do we do that? How do we make the reviews just a, a, a positive encourager for our staff? So first of all, just to make sure we're on the same page, appraisals are part, a core part of performance management. Very important, but only one of the components. Why do we do it? Because we want to lead to effective job and performance management. So by providing a structured review process, you can clarify the job responsibilities and expectations for your CAO or staff. Also, it can enhance productivity because then your staff knows what's expected of them. They do better, they're more productive, they're motivated, so they're more productive. And it's just a, it's not a vicious circle, it's a very positive circle. Um, doing a performance review properly develops people to their potential because you can have those career and development conversations. And just to skip over really the, the last points are really around improving communication and, and also improving those discussions around pay, which can otherwise be difficult. So those are some of the less tangible um, reasons that we have effective performance management. But it hits the bottom line. Reduce expenses with time wastage, and depending on what kind of, if you're an organization, might be increasing revenue or profit. So there's really a five-step cycle on the how. How do we implement effective performance management? So I'm going to just mention quickly the first one. We start with some good goal setting, but we're going to jump right to the fourth step, which is performance evaluation. But before I do that, I just want to be clear that there are other steps in there, that there should be ongoing communication between yourself and your staff or your CAO. Why? Because reviews should never have negative surprises. So if there is a performance issue, if you are a CAO and you have a performance issue on your staff, or if you're a counsel with a, a performance issue, your CAO, those discussions don't happen in the review. They happen outside. The review is really a time to focus on development, encouragement, positive messages. So in that five-step cycle, the second last one is the evaluation of the performance. So evaluating performance, there's two components. One is measuring the results, and one is measuring the behavior. So the results are more objective, they're somewhat easier to measure, and behavior is more subjective. So let's just take a couple slides to look at the results. When you're measuring results for a staff member, it's important that you have job performance indicators, in other words, goals. So that might be, maybe for an administrator, that might be um, staying within budget, for example. Then you have some comments, how did it go? And then you have a rating, uh, an objective three, usually three or five point rating scale. So let's just take a look at that first and third column. Everybody, I'm sure, has heard of SMART goals before, but you really want to set goals that are specific and uh, so there's not no ambiguity about what you're expecting of your staff. You need those goals to be measurable so that you know if they've been uh, met, attainable. There's nothing more frustrating than having your performance evaluated on something that you have no control over. You need the goals to be relevant to the job, and I'll mention a word about that in a minute, and they need to be time-based. So that's that first column. And then when you're evaluating performance, new in the role, or maybe there's a gap that there needs to be some training. Again, they should not discover that at the review, but there, that might be a rating. And then five might be consistently exceeding. So 
most people should score a three in this kind of a rating. It's not three is not a failure. Three is a very much consistently meeting the expectation and is a very positive review. So that's just a very high overview of how you would um, go about measuring and evaluating your staff's results. Now, what about behaviors? Behaviors focus on not so much what happened, but why or how did it happen. This is very important because it helps to point to your probability of future success. So, I think about our dear Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Sometimes they have an ugly win, and we're not really confident that they're going to win next week. But so that the how they win, how the results have come about, that are just as important as the actual win or loss. So. Um, Right, so we're going to focus here on those areas where we want our staff or administrator to start doing, stop doing, and continue doing. So how do you measure those? We measure them, sorry I'm missing a couple slides here so I'll just, I'll just mention it. Behaviors, um, another word for that you often hear batted around behaviors and competencies. Competencies are a broader category that are made up of several behaviors. So you might just hear them. So we sometimes talk about competencies like leadership, communication, customer focused. So those are really the kinds of things that we measure with the 360. And uh, again, um, my fault, there's a slide missing there. A 360 degree rating system, if you're not familiar with it, it's an anonymous. Um, system whereby the person who's being rated does not know who says what about them, but there are approximately 3 to 20 um, people that are asked to complete a survey about the administrator or staff member, and um, 3 to 20 is a wide range, we usually recommend more like 5 to 15, you want, you want not too many that some issues would get watered down, but enough that you can keep the, the results anonymous. So. Um, so it's a process whereby uh, a wide variety of people complete a um, uh, survey about the person being evaluated on their behaviors, more about their competencies and behaviors. So that's what it is. Um, and then you evaluate the results against a benchmark. So there's a, hundreds, thousands of people in the database that comprise the benchmark and then you're evaluating, let's say, your CAO against this benchmark instead of comparing them to another individual, which would be much more difficult to do. So why do you do these? It helps your, again, this is focused on CAO, but again, if you're an administrator, think of your staff, or if you're a vendor, think of your employees, anybody. It really helps your direct reports recognize strengths and growth opportunities. It helps to open up those discussions. You get insights about how others think about you, not just counsel, but it might be other, CAOs, or it might be your staff, it might be peers, suppliers, anybody who really has to deal with you and, and is in a position to, to give insights into how you are on your job. As I mentioned, it's well-rounded and it's in a safe environment because you are compared against the benchmark. And topics come up that are a great segue for coaching. So, you know, if you say, well, I'd like to get coaching, I'd like to be better, but I don't know what what to ask to get coached on. So the results that come out, especially in the comments, can be very specific to that individual and give some really good feedback. So that's why we would do it. And just how it works, uh, kind of alluded to this already, but you basically need to first select the most, the best assessment. We, we have people first have several types. We have, let's say council might not like them. Um, it, it does can take some time to prepare and, and therefore expense. There can be a fear that it's going to be awkward. Again, it shouldn't be because those conversations should have happened if there's a real issue. But still, it can be awkward talking about somebody's performance. It just it's not always a comfortable uh, setting. And maybe there maybe there hasn't been value in the past, so they're just kind of seen as a waste of time. We have to get this thing over with. It's January. Let's get it over with, and then we can move on with the real business of of the year um, and, and just lack of training because it's really uh, not something that everybody intuitively knows about. And then as dealing with that salary increase can be difficult if there's no objective data to compare to. So why CAOs might not enjoy them, 
Um, there was a survey done by a thousand companies in the U.S. corporate executive board, and 66% of employees, almost two thirds, were dissatisfied with their whole performance management process, and 65% thought that their performance management did not tie to their jobs. So it's no wonder that they're dissatisfied if it, if it has no no link. So again, it's just that that tense, awkward, little thought put into it, and so we're going to change that. It's most important that employees think that it's fair. It needs to, their performance should be commensurate with how the review goes. When they think it's fair, they're going to be more likely to digest the information and have it encourage and motivate them to do better next year. So we increase, the 360 is one way of in, in increasing the, the perception of fairness simply because it is transparent. The results come back, they're on the page, that's what we have some objective data to work with. And it is specific, so the 360s do provide specific information. Don't compare to others. And it involves the administrator or staff. That's important too. They should have a say in where their performance evaluation goes. So another way to involve the administrator, not just through the 360, because the person that gets evaluated also completes one of the surveys, there is also something called a self-appraisal that can go a little bit deeper. About two weeks before the review, you'll have the individual complete a self-appraisal where you might say, you know, what are you really proud of this year? What, if you could have a do-over, what would that be? What would that look like? So it just helps to really remember, go through the year, come prepared, not feel like you're a deer stuck in the headlight at the review thinking, I don't know what to say. Um, so and really say, involving the individual. And that you might have them handed in ahead of time or they might just walk into the review with that. So if you are the one giving feedback, you want to make sure that you focus on what you see, not interpret. So you want it to be objective. Also, we focus on the behavior or competency. So we might talk about communication skills as opposed to calling somebody a bully or something. That's, um, you know, we don't talk about personality. Keep it neutral. We want to advise, I'll just jump to the six and seven. We want it to be clear, which sometimes means simple, um, not simplistic, but just be clear and, and precise. And an example of not being clear and precise, instead we prefer this effective feedback model where you start really building trust. You open the dialogue with a foundation of trust, and then you're specific about the behavior and the impact that it has. You do a great job communicating, and your team really knows what to do, and you know they have good engagement, or something like that. Be specific, not just you're doing a great job. And then it's really important that you let the person being evaluated and reviewed give their feedback, and that's where the self-appraisal can, can come into play. It forces that step, but it's important just to, you know, how do you think it went? And then it's important too to have a resolution. So let's agree, usually there's a, a paper signed that everybody signs off on on the review at the results and um, so it's important to have that clear so again they're not walking away with anything um, confusing for them so what's next what would be the next steps if if uh, you currently do not have a performance appraisal process uh, you want to be clear why you're having it if you go into your office and announce to your staff oh we're going to um, evaluate your performance immediately human nature there must be something wrong with my performance but it's actually quite the contrary you're wanting it to be a motivating process so you want to be clear and educate people up front take that fear out we really do recommend especially if it's the first time doing some sort of a 360 or assessment so there's some some information to start with um, there needs to be somebody in charge not the whole council but somebody that should be in charge of the process can't really tell on the slide so much, but the word start is in bold. Don't worry about the process being perfect. If you're not already doing it, just start. It's Jan, well, no, I guess it's not January, it's February now. Um, so, you know, it's still early enough in the year that it's, if you're in a calendar year cycle, it's still a good time to start with that goal setting and then you'll be ready for the review at the end of the year. Practice. Practice makes perfect. Um, if you already have a uh, performance management system, which I would suspect most do, um, but you're just thinking maybe it could use a bit of a new coat of paint or maybe some, some fine tuning, again, be clear why you're doing it and if you do make changes, communicate that also. 
Um, if you haven't considered self appraisals or 360s, we you know we really recommend that you consider that. We haven't had time to look for bias pitfalls, but you know just conscious of things like the recency effect or confirmation bias. Look those up. We don't have time today. And then evaluate how it's going, and then that practice is again the same as before. So I just wanted to take a quick minute just to let you know a bit about people first. Um, we are a um, SUMA Vantage partner. We are a full service HR consulting firm with consultants all over Saskatchewan. And uh, we do focus, this is where we operate. You'll see Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Northwestern Ontario are the big circles. The head office is in Winnipeg, so it's not surprising that that's kind of where our focal area is. We actually do um, work with every municipality in Manitoba, and more recently we just entered, come into Saskatchewan, and we're working with um, communities now in Saskatchewan, so that's very exciting. And when I say full service, this is really the list of everything that, that we do, and that doesn't really do it justice. But you see there's one in, in bold HR at your service, and that is what um, SUMA members have access to. Again, you can come by the booth if you want more information, I'd rather take your questions. Um, but really, it's through the entire employee life cycle that we do um, do support. So performance management is one of those that can help increase engagement. It can help retain your top management, and it obviously can help with performance. It helps with employee development. It helps with succession because then you can identify growth needs if somebody is going to be taking on a role with more responsibility, and it can really help through them through the entire cycle. So that's. All I have. Any questions, comments? Okay. Well, thank you, Michelle, for your time today. And I, I think it's important to note that they'll be available at the trade show if there is a question. Our next vendor panel will be starting in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Good afternoon and uh, thank you for joining us in this vendor showcase. Today uh, we're going to be talking about something that's very important to all of our hometowns, community fire protection. I'm Mike Strachan, I'm the Vice President of Suma for Villages, Resort Villages in Northern Communities. I'm also the Mayor of Torquay. And I want to introduce you to uh, Lance Spencer of Fort Gary who's going to give a presentation today. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate everybody showing up today. I don't want you fighting over seats. So. Well, I'm, I'm Lance from Fort Gary Fire Trucks in Winnipeg. My uh, clicker isn't working here, so uh, I'll get the old fashioned. Oh, yeah, we're good. We're good. Ultimately, uh, Fort Gary's been around since 1919. Um, we're Assume Advantage Partners, so. What that means for you folks is you don't have to spend an awful lot of time creating a tender that can be 120 pages. Uh, Fort Gary is a preferred vendor. Uh, we're Canadian Free Trade and uh, partnership of the U.S. version, so we're compliant. Uh, established in 1919 in Winnipeg, we're the largest fire truck manufacturer in Canada. We employ over 120 staff with sales of approximately 40 million. Um, our dealer network has contacts across North America and worldwide. Uh, I take care of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, we sell in Chile, Jamaica, China. Uh, in a typical year, we sell 75 to 85 fire trucks and about 20 or 25 municipal vehicles like water delivery and septic trucks, uh, the odd garbage truck, snow plows, you name it, I can probably help you with it. In 2011, uh, lots of people uh, know us as Fort Gary Industries, but in 2011, we became a separate entity and concentrate solely on fire trucks. Uh, we're now in a brand new manufacturing facility. We're Canadian family owned and operated, and we're based in Winnipeg where we build and, and service and, and maintain them. We're not a Canadian distributor of American made fire trucks, like an awful lot of my competition. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's called Fire Underwriter Survey. Um, there's essentially three agencies, FUS, um, ULC, and NFPA that a lot of people will reference. There's some misconceptions about uh, time for replacement, liability concerns, that sort of thing. Uh, Fire Underwriter Survey is uh, Canadian. They, they determine the rates that uh, ratepayers in your community pay, and it's based on a lot of different variables including uh, the number of firefighters in the community, the number of uh, apparatus, and how old they are, the water supply capability, are the hydrants, are you dropping a suction hose in a lake, etc. ULC stands for Underwriters Labs of Canada. Uh, it's a testing and, and organization. Every fire truck that we build has to be inspected by a third party ULC certified uh, auditor. Uh, he'll check things like the speed, um, the distance to stop a truck, the, the pump operation. Um, uh, the bottom there talks about Rick Suchet, the CEO and owner of FGFT, is on the board of Fire uh, ULC, so we often know ahead of time what changes are coming in the industry. Uh, back in the day, firefighters used to ride on the back of a truck. Well, a couple fell off, got seriously injured or killed, so that's not acceptable anymore. Um, you know, various safety features like that. The National Fire Protection Agency, NFPA, is also accepted by FUS. That's the American equivalent of the ULC standards in Canada. But they don't test, they don't, uh, they don't provide criteria. It's just public opinion, essentially. So they have a lot of good features, and the two, the two uh, mirror each other fairly closely now. But uh, one of the things they, they dictate is fire apparatus should be built by reputable certified manufacturers and tested by an accredited third party. Uh, lots of communities don't have money for brand new and uh, volunteer firefighters that are electricians or, or uh, welders will you know, turn a milk truck into a tanker and then you know, it's not baffled. It doesn't have the braking capability or the front and rear axle uh, EBW that it needs and somebody flips it and gets hurt or killed. And, you know, these, these agencies don't want that to happen. Uh, Fire Underwriter Survey has reviewed experiences across Canada and around the world and came up with a standard 
uh, for the age of frontline and reserve status fire trucks. What they've come up with is in a major center like Regina, Winnipeg, Saskatoon, you know, those calls, those communities will go on five, 6,000 calls a year. They can use a truck for 15 years before they should move it to reserve status. Uh, smaller communities, you know, uh, uh, Wosley, Lanigan, etc. they might go on 100 calls a year. Well, you can keep that truck 16 to 20 years if you maintain it. And, you know, after that, it should be relegated to reserve status. Uh, uh, your first out pumper is down for repairs. You can use that truck. It's better to have something than nothing. After 25, 20, 25 years, as far as fire underwriter survey is concerned, you don't have a fire apparatus anymore. Uh, scale of 1 to 10, they'll rate your community. One being <laughs> ideal, you have full-time paid uh, full-time firefighters, hydrants on every street corner. Smaller communities might get an 8 or a 9 out of 10, which is the, the tail end of uh, you're paying an awful lot more in insurance premiums than you would if you had newer equipment. And uh, after, after 26 years, um, there's some options available to you. But uh, in the fire service, trucks look like new. They're meticulously maintained. The paint is spotless. You know, a 20-year-old truck might have 30,000 kilometers on it, but when it's in use, they're they're driven hard. You know, they're pumping, they're flying to the sea, and the toll this takes on an apparatus doesn't show on the exterior because they're well maintained. But the problem is uh, limited parts availability. Uh, vehicles have low kilometers, but lack of use can sometimes be as detrimental to a vehicle's performance as speed as overuse. Uh, seals will dry out, uh, parts corrode. Uh, fire apparatus should respond to alarms the first 15 years of service. During this period, they're 95% likely you're not going to have a problem, but the next five years, maybe reserve status uh, it replaces uh, down trucks or it can be on scene. Sometimes the, the fire scene might be more than one truck can handle. It's good to have it there. But it should be retired from service at 20 years of age. Um, present practice indicates the first purchaser probably took very good care of it. At 20 years or more, it's probably sold or traded in. It's the second, maybe third user who doesn't take care of the uh, pump tests and oil changes as meticulously as they might have with a newer one. Uh, it might have inadequate braking, slower pickup and acceleration. Um, Structurally weakened chassis due to constant load bearing and overloading. Trucks typically get heavier and heavier as they get older because departments put more and more stuff on it. Absorb all <coughs> vehicle X tools. You know, they, they jam 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound can is you know, kind of a, a saying in the industry. Noise levels. Um, before current restrictions, sirens and lights used to be right above the firefighters in the cab. Uh, current ULC standards say it has to be down and forward so you're not blowing the eardrums of the guys going to the scene. Um, you've probably seen a lot of fire trucks now with the green and yellow striping on the back of them. Uh, that's a uniform standard to say, hey, this is an emergency vehicle, it's not a construction truck. Uh, slow down, move over. Seat belts and seat belt sensors. Nowadays, you know, you're driving a truck, you can see that seat number three behind you isn't wearing a seat belt. On your 85 front mount pumper, that's not likely something you have. Uh, fire underwriters survey uh, modified the age requirement. They know smaller communities don't have a magic wand to make millions of dollars uh, appear to replace older equipment with brand new stuff. So what they've agreed is that if you tested an, an EBT certified technician, according to NFPA 1071, at 15, 20, and 25 years, or after any major overhaul. If that truck meets the original specs, you can keep it a little longer. Um, I, I still think there's some liability concerns if a truck was to fail en route to a call or at a call. Um, savvy insurance adjuster will beat you up if you had a 30-year-old truck. But the intent is that uh, you know safely provide emergency coverage. That's that's the end goal. Uh, I talked a little bit about milk trucks. Uh, Liability insurance. Fort Gary fire trucks carries $25 million. Uh, God forbid a truck fails because of a manufacturing defect. Some of my competition carries as little as a million dollars, and 
frankly, that wouldn't cover the lawyer bills if something ever happened. Uh, some of the, the testing that should be done pretty regularly, load balance is, uh, is the load on the front axle and the rear axle safely spread out. Um, center of gravity, uh, trucks can be built entirely too tall and they become a tip hazard with a full load of water and maybe an inexperienced driver behind the wheel. Pump performance, uh, you know, as the seals wear, a pump might have been rated to a thousand gallons per minute when you bought it, but years later it's only pumping out at 800 gallons per minute. Uh, it could be an issue at a fire scene. Ladder trucks is a, is a question I get pretty regularly. If you have, you know, this and a fire underwriter survey says five buildings three stories tall or more, you should have a ladder truck. Again, that doesn't make a million seven appear in your budget, but uh, you know some communities around Winnipeg have had uh, trouble with warehouses and apartment buildings, some of the high hazard occupancies, schools, hospitals, nursing homes, um, grain drying facilities, potash mines. You know, they they need an elevated waterway. It's not strictly a rescue. It's more than getting somebody off a balcony. Uh, if you can get water and lights up high, it, it makes the, uh, the fight in the fire a whole lot easier. Apartments, offices, uh, clothing. Um, stock trucks. Fort Gary builds uh, the odd truck, like the one I've got here, um, just in case somebody fails a safety or gets t boned by a transport. We've got something on the ground for immediate delivery, including the top left corner there, a nice little what we call a Bronto Sky Arm for the low, low price of a million seven. Uh, that bottom one sold very recently for about 500,000. The one up in the top right corner is a tanker, a uh, tandem axle that was carrying 3,000 gallons of water as a dump chute off the back to fill a portable tank. And we're asking 435 for that. Um, the water deliveries and septic trucks, you know, we build two or three of those all the time. So. Uh, 120, 140, depending on options. We've always got something available. Uh, questions? Uh, I don't know if any of you have questions about older equipment or criteria and that sort of thing, but now's the time. Come on, Chief, you must have a question. All right. Well, thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks for your presentation, Lance. Lance will be available at his booth today and tomorrow for all Thanks those questions.